everything is going to hell down here in Texas. What's everybody? Big Bad Bob here with you. Welcome to the Moon Gummin Podcast. Research comes to shine, and this come to die. Stay tuned. Be right now. Hola, como esta, and all that jazz. This is your boy Rob Clark. This is the Lone Gummin Podcast, episode number 198, folks. 198. Jack Ruby be trippin'. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if that doesn't kind of give away the uh, surprise in this show, <clears throat> we're going to dive into the sick and twisted, demented mind of the assassin of the accused assassin of the president of the United States. That's right. Mr. Jack Ruby, otherwise known as Jacob Rubenstein. But for the purposes of this show, he will be Jack Ruby. <laughs> um, you know, he's one of those very interesting characters of the story who is still hard to figure out to this day. I mean, from the amount of character witnesses that we have from people that knew Jack Ruby, worked for Jack Ruby, knew Jack Ruby growing up, um, had interactions with Jack Ruby in Dallas. You know, we're going to touch on all this stuff. And see if we can figure out what in the hell is going on here. Um, as I've said multiple times throughout the years and on various episodes, that yeah. I believe that Jack Ruby had a very, I, th I think that he was pressured to kill Oswald. And the reason why I say that is. Everything that we know about Jack Ruby's life, and we know a lot, um, Jack Ruby had never killed anybody before. Jack Ruby had never shot anyone before or attempted to. Um, and... You know, for someone who's never done that, who has lived their life up to a certain point and never done that, to do that when there's no self-motivating factor. And what I mean by that is that nothing was done directly to Jack Ruby for him to react like this. You know, like... You know, nobody caught him coming out of his house and pistol whipped him and, uh, you know, threw him down in the yard, ripped his jacket off, pissed on him and left him laying there enough for Jack Ruby to be mad enough to want to kill somebody over. It. You know, we have various reports of, of people acting up in his clubs, uh, disrespecting him and his dancers, you know, where he beat them or throw them out on the sidewalk and, or fight them. Uh, but never killing anyone, you know, and, and as I said, it, for a non self motivating factor for someone to take another human being's life in exchange for what is essentially going to be their own. Um, because Jack Ruby, cho Jack Ruby chose to do this in front of a, uh, 
basement full of police officers, um, the chances of him getting caught were, I'd say, 99.99999%. And I don't care how dim-witted you are, uh, Jack Ruby would have known that the odds were definitely not in his favor uh, as far as getting away with murdering or killing or shooting uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. And, excuse me, from the, uh, from Jack Ruby's known movements and photos and video of him from that day, or that weekend, I should say, uh, you know, we do know that, that uh, Ruby was, for lack of a better word, stalking Oswald in the police department going so far as to act or impersonate a, a newsman who would go on to correct um, Henry Wade uh, at the midnight press conference. So, you know, we see Jack Ruby in the hallways. We see Jack Ruby at the press conference. Um, chances are good that he was either getting the balls to do it or he was going to do it that night, but then got cold feet. Um, we do know now Ruby had said that he did have his revolver with him in his pocket. Um, maybe he never got the right, what I would call option. But I think if he would have shot him in the police station, he would have had a better chance of getting away with all those news people around uh, than he did in the, in the basement. Um, but again, chances of him getting caught doing it in the police station are probably 99.98888% uh, odds not in his favor. So, uh, you know... Like I said, it takes an awful big motivation to, to essentially throw your life away to take someone else's life that you don't even know. It did nothing to you personally. So I believe that Jack Ruby, Jack Ruby had a motivating factor that we just don't know about. And we don't know from whom. Can we guess? Sure, we can guess. We can speculate. But... And, you know, you know, Jack Ruby may have thought that he had such a good relationship with the cops in Dallas at the time that they would essentially pat him on the back and turn him loose after doing this, uh, you know, for the good of the nation, you know, to save the family from having to come back to trial. Um, and that's what they may have told him. And in his delusional mind, that kind of made sense. But then something changed and he realized that they weren't just going to turn him loose, that he had to face trial, but you know, chances of him going to trial for this and getting off were pretty good. I mean, what do you do? He just killed the assass alleged assassin of the president. I mean, it wasn't like he, uh, killed mother Teresa or anything like that. Um, so maybe he still thought that his chances were good of, of beating the rap for this uh, when it comes to a jury of 12 of his peers. But sadly, that wasn't the case either. So we have uh, Swift Texas Justice, my friends. That's what we like to call that. As we all know, Jack Ruby killed Oswald on November the 24th, 1963. And Within uh, the span of four months, he's already had his trial and a guilty verdict and sentenced to death. Uh, his trial started on March the 4th, 1964. It lasted 10 days. Judge Joe Brown. The chief prosecutors in the case were Bill Alexander, Jim Bowie, 
Henry Wade Jr. and Frank Watts. Uh, Ruby's defense lawyers were Melvin, Belli, Phil Burleson, Robert Denson, Elmer Gertz, Tom Howard, William Kunstler, and Joe Tonahill. Um, you know, th th they didn't mess around back then when it came to uh, speedy trials, your right to a speedy trial. I mean, nowadays, my God, you could wait years just to go to trial. Uh, back then, things moved at a, a bit of a quicker pace. So, Melvin Belli, you know, Jack Ruby's main defense lawyer for his trial, I had planned to write a book and produce a movie about the trial. So he undertook the defense of Jack Ruby uh, free of charge, pro bono, quid pro bono. Uh, Belli tried, but he failed to get a change of venue from Dallas. And ultimately, he had to accept that among eight men and four women jurors, one who, watching television at that instant, had actually witnessed uh, Ruby's act. Twenty prosecution witnesses testified during the trial, and of those, Detective James Lavelle, who had been handcuffed to Oswald, testified that as he lay bleeding, Ruby said, I hope this son of a bitch dies. Officer D.R. Archer testified that he told Ruby, uh, I think you killed him. And Ruby's reply was, I intended to shoot him three times. Officer Thomas D. McMillan testified that he heard Ruby say, you rat son of a bitch, you shot the president. A review of television tapes, however, showed that as Ruby fired at Oswald, Officer McMillan was far to the rear and looking away from the action and therefore couldn't have heard anything. Sergeant Patrick Dean's testimony was damaging. Ten minutes after the shooting, he said Ruby told him that on Friday night, when he noticed this, that sarcastic sneer on Oswald's face, that he thought he would kill him. Essentially, uh, nailing Ruby for premeditated murder. Now, the defense set out to prove that, well, let's just say this. They had two options. Uh, one, since this was on national television, although it never did actually show Ruby's face, they had two options. They could claim that the man on television was not Jack Ruby, but somehow the men, the man that the police arrested right after the shooting was in fact Jack Ruby, or they could go the other route, which is, hey, Jack Ruby is insane. He's out of his mind. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's crazy. He had a mental breakdown. You can't hold him accountable for that. So Jack Ruby's defense team set out to prove that Jack Ruby had a troubled mind. Attorney Belli first called Little Lynn, a 19-year-old stripper, who said that Ruby had a very quick temper. He'd fly off the handle. Another stripper, Penny Dollar, uh, that's 50 Cent's uh, cousin, told of Ruby's fighting with a taxi driver, beating his head on the sidewalk, and then stopping suddenly and asking, Did I do this? In a very Urkel manner. <clears throat> Next came testimony from the experts, folks. Dr. Roy Schaefer, Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Psychology at Yale University, had performed psychological tests on Ruby. I determined that he did have organic brain damage, Schaefer said. The most likely specific nature of it was psychomotor epilepsy. He added that Ruby suffered from mood swings and impulsiveness, uh, which today we would call bipolar disorder and ADHD. <laughs> Would Ruby be subject to the states of rage? Asked Belli. Yup, said Schaefer. 
What might set him off? A very strong emotional stimulation, states of fatigue, certain kinds of light stimulation, and a certain kind of flickering light. So basically, the very strong emotional stimulation is, is the loss of a president in his hometown. States of fatigue, they could show that Jack Ruby wasn't getting very much sleep or rest that weekend in light of his activities at the police station, at the radio station, at the newspaper, running around with his buddies. Um, and then get this, certain kinds of light st simulation. So a certain kind of flickering light. You mean like the kind that pops off when newspaper reporters take a picture, you know, kind of as they're bringing, you know, the accused assassin of the president out to transfer him. And all of a sudden, all of these cameras start popping off with their flashes. So they're basically stating that it was a prime, uh, the perfect primordial suit for Jack Ruby to snap. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Martin Towler, a neurologist at the University of Texas in Galveston and a court appointed expert who had examined Ruby testified to the defendant's history of head injuries and probable psychomotor variant epilepsy. During a seizure, asked Belli, will he know what he's doing? No, replied the witness. He is behaving as an automaton. Most patients will be amnesic. So an automaton, huh? Okay. Dr. Manfred Guttmacher, Chief Medical Officer of the Supreme Court of Baltimore and an expert on criminal psychology, testified, I don't think he was capable of knowing right from wrong or understood the nature and consequences of his act. I think he was struggling to keep his sanity. I think he had an unusual degree of involvement in the whole tragedy. There was a disruption of his ego a very short-lived psychotic episode in which the hostile part of his makeup, which is very strong, became focused on this one individual, and homicide was the result. Okay? So, hmm. he doesn't think that he was capable of knowing right from wrong or understood the nature and consequences of his act. Now, Jack Ruby was what we would call today a mixture of ADHD, OCD, bipolar. I mean, it's a bad mix all, all around, sure. Um, and taking uppers probably didn't help things at all. Um, so all of this kind of resulted in Jack Ruby being a bit of a uh, high-strung individual. Um, you know, somebody that's always on the go, somebody that's always fast-talking, somebody that's always got to be doing something, going somewhere, meeting somebody, doing something. Uh, that type of guy, wheeler dealer, just, 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 just always on. Um, but the guy, Jack Ruby, always was looking out for his business. He was always looking for new talent. He was always trying to book things. Uh, he had two dogs he took care of. He liked to work out at the Y. Um, and then, you know, his personal lifestyle, as we all know from Dago, uh, you know, he loved to just eat him and stuff. Uh, so, but I've also heard reports that Jack Ruby also had relations with mm, a lot of his dancers and strippers. Um, and he also pimped them out a lot to various, uh, let's just say, clubs or meetings or groups of people or parties even to the police um sexual favors so i believe he was a very deliberate man in what he was doing um he knew how to run a business he knew how to um organize his structure basically in his business 
to keep it running. Um, you know, and that takes a certain level of intelligence and, and, and know-how and motivation and things of this nature. You know, by all accounts, Jack Ruby uh, wasn't an alcoholic. If he did drink, it wasn't very much. Um, Drug-wise, I think he was on some uppers, um, you know, just to keep him going back then. But I don't think he was a full-blown drug addict. I don't think he was doing smack or, or downers or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to be a certain kind of person to run multiple businesses. Um, you know, was his personal life in the, in, the, in, in the best array ever? No, of course not. You know, you'd think somebody of, of this stature would have a nice house. Um you know, but Jack Ruby was always seemed to be moving around a little bit throughout Dallas. You know, an apartment here, an apartment there, a roommate here, a roommate there. Um, never settling down with a woman, never having kids. Um, you know, he was a bit all over the place. And messy is all get out. I mean, that's why George Senator, his roommate, at the time of the assassination, had actually been his roommate before, a little bit before this, and had moved out of Ruby's apartment because it was so messy, like he was a pack rat. Um, just kept stuff all around, messy, didn't clean anything. Um, and he actually moved into a, a neighbor of Jack Ruby's apartment to get away from all the clutter and mess. And then when... Uh, this guy gave up his apartment. Uh, Ruby let George Senator move back in with him because he didn't have any place to go. So, you know, and, and he was a somewhat of a good hearted dude, I guess you could say. I mean, he get, he did give, uh, you know, people places to live, let him stay with him for a little while. Um, you know, he would he would give it cash advances to his dancers when they needed it. Uh, he kind of took care of him, made sure nobody else disrespected him. Um, you know, he even gave Larry Crayford, uh, you know, a room and and, and, a, and a job, basically. Um, you know, he even employed uh, the Negro bartender back in the day, which wasn't wasn't exactly heard of in Dallas. Um, I mean, does all this make Jack Ruby a great human being? No. Was he shady? Probably. Um, you know, but it, it just gives you an insight, a little bit more of an insight into this twisted, <laughs> you know, uh, what was going on in his mind? What kind of a person was he? Um, so this is the kind of stuff that they were looking at in his trial to try to prove that he was out of his mind when he committed this heinous act of murder. Uh, and hoping that they could get him off. So, Dr. Manfred Gittmacher goes on to say, I think he was struggling to keep his sanity. I think he had an unusual degree of involvement in the whole tragedy. Uh, there was a disruption of his ego, a very short-lived psychotic episode in which the hostile part of his makeup, which is very strong, became focused on this one individual, and homicide was the result. And I know I read that already, but... It's interesting how these doctors, you know, could twist things around a little bit to support one side or the other, you know, either the defense or the prosecution. Um, so late on the afternoon of Thursday, March 12th, this is during his trial, the prosecution presented its rebuttal of findings on Ruby's electroencephalograph. That's EEG for those who don't know. And I, it's understandable if you don't, because I didn't. Testified to by a leading expert, a Dr. Frederick Gibbs of Chicago. His written conclusion had been that the EEG recordings show seizure disorders of the psychomotor variant type. Gibbs had refused earlier invitations to appear in person as a witness. Now, hearing disagreement on his opinion, he hopped on a plane and flew to Dallas that Thursday evening and testified the next morning without a fee. 
uh, I guess he was pissed. Standing before the jury with the EEG tracings, he said, Jack Ruby has a particular, very rare form of epilepsy. The pattern occurs only in one half of 1% of epileptics. It is a distinctive and unusual epileptic pattern. So, the pattern occurs in one half of 1% of all epileptics in the world. Hmm. Prosecutor Bill Alexander tried to get Dr. Gibbs to say that psychomotor variant epilepsy was not a disease. I say it is a disease, said the doctor. That is diagnosable from a brain wave reading. So, yeah, boy, they're on the cutting edge of technology back in 1964 when it comes to printouts of brain wave, brain wave readings. Say that 20 times fast. Judge Joe Brown's charge to the jury and defense and prosecution closing arguments went well past one in the morning on Saturday, March 14th. I think Joe, Judge Joe Brown was ready to wrap this son of a bitch up. And that afternoon, after deliberating for only two hours and 19 minutes before finding Jack Ruby guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment, and we assess his punishment at death. So after a whopping 10-day trial and a lot of trying to make Jack Ruby look like he had some kind of a psychomotor epileptic disease that half a percent of all epileptics in the world have, the jury didn't buy it, folks. More than two and a half years of appeals followed, and finally, on October the 5th, 1966, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals found that Ruby's statements to police immediately after shooting Oswald should not have been admitted as evidence and that he should have been granted a change of venue. So, a new trial was scheduled for Wichita Falls, Kansas. However, when that city sheriff traveled to Dallas to get Ruby in December of 1966, he found him too sick to move. Jail doctors had not taken Ruby's stomach complaint seriously. Ah, oh, you just got the squirts, Jack. It's nothing. It's not no big deal. Just a little gassy. But Parkland Hospital physicians now found that cancer was living in his liver, brain, and lungs, resulting in Jack Ruby's death on January the 3rd, 1967. So there you have it, folks. <laughs> the short-lived trial and aftermath of Jack Ruby uh, and his psychotic evaluation that the jury just did not buy. Did not buy at all. And, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, juries like, you know, maybe it was just too early to be taking any, a lot of this, uh, hypothetical medical information into account, you know. I mean, seriously. Everybody saw Jack Ruby shoot and kill Oswald. Doesn't matter, you know, if you're a crazy person, whatever. Somebody let him into the basement. Uh, or he knew how to sneak in there. And he did the deed. And uh, that's the bottom line. The jury didn't buy this whole psychomotor epilepsy deal. And uh, can't say is that I blame him. You know, when you see Jack Ruby interviewed, uh, you know, after his, initially after his arrest, he was very prescient. He was very with it. Um, and he, he even granted interviews with several news people, media. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't buy the whole, the whole thing. Because, yeah, you know, Jack Ruby said a lot of things after he was arrested. You know, he said the truth will never come above board as to his involvement in, in, in the shooting. And that people in very high positions, uh, you know, were, were aware of what was going on. Uh, he was scared to death to be in jail in Dallas. He figured, he figured that they would try to kill him in Dallas. They wanted him 
or he wanted them to move him to Washington, D.C. so he could talk to the president directly about what he knew and why he did what he did, but they wouldn't do it. Um, so, yeah, I don't buy the whole psychotic episode uh, either. So the trial ends. Jack Ruby is sentenced to death. But of course, um, you know, his lawyers let him know, hey, Jack, this isn't the end, buddy. We we can still do some appeals. We can we can do this. The damn Patrick Dean uh, testimony shouldn't have been included. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have had this trial in Dallas. Too many people know who you are, saw what you did on TV, heard about things, uh, you know, so... Don't worry, we'll get to we'll get we'll get another retrial. We'll get the trial moved somewhere else where nobody knows you. Um, this, that, and the other. You just hang in there, buddy, old pal. Don't worry, we'll get you out of this mess. Type of thing, right? So, uh, six weeks after the trial ended, though, you know, of course, he's confined in the Dallas County Jail under the watchful eyes of. Sheriff Bill Decker. Uh, Ruby starts doing some pretty weird shit in jail. Uh, to the point where the local doctors uh, decide to call in the quote unquote big guns because they're at a loss to explain the behavior of Jack Ruby. And on April the 26th, 1964, um, there's a report written about the psych psychiatric examination of Jack Ruby. Uh, it starts off two weeks ago. Dr. Hubert Smith asked me whether I would be willing to examine Mr. Jack Ruby presently under death sentence in the Dallas County Jail and without financial resources. I agreed with the unique understanding that the examination would be without fee and with the prior knowledge of the American Psychiatric Association as well as with the assistance of some qualified Texas colleagues and that the results of my examination would be completely available to the court. Four days ago, uh, Dr. Smith requested that I come to Dallas today to see Mr. Ruby briefly and to testify at a hearing tomorrow regarding the possible value of further psychiatric, psychiatric studies of Jack Ruby. Hypnosis and intravenous sodium pentothal were included among possible techniques to provide further information concerning Ruby's state of mind at the time he shot Lee Harvey Oswald on November the 24th, 1963. I received copies of some of the previously reported examinations of, of Mr. Ruby by several different specialists, but was unable to read them until earlier today on the airplane. Tonight, my own findings make it clear that there has been an, an acute change in the patient's condition since these earlier studies has, have been, were carried out. Upon arriving at the jail this afternoon, I met Sheriff Bill Decker, who informed me that last night, after midnight, Mr. Ruby had tricked his guard into stepping out to get him a glass of water. Excuse me. And then had run and struck his head against the wall. It was not clear whether or how how long the prisoner was unconscious. Uh, according to the sheriff, Mr. Ruby had subsequently been taken to a hospital where a physician examined him, including x-ray films of the skull and stated that he was without serious injury. It was also said that Mr. Ruby had been caught stripping out the lining of his prison garb, apparently to fashion a noose for himself. Hmm. The examination was undertaken in a private interview room. Mr. Ruby appeared pale, tremulous, agitated, and depressed. Said to be usually meticulous in his appearance, he was now disheveled and unkempt. He stared fixedly at the examiner with an expression of suspicion. His pupils were markedly dilated. There was a large abrasion on top of his head. 
An area on the left cheek appeared swollen and reddened. At first he was unwilling to be left alone with me, and seemed to anticipate some terrible news or fearful event. However, it was possible gradually over the course of an hour to obtain a reasonable sample of the patient's mental content. This can be summarized as follows. Last night, the patient became convinced that all the Jews in America were being slaughtered, and that this was in retaliation against him, Jack Ruby, the Jew, who was responsible for all the trouble. Somehow, through an awful mistake and the distortions and misunderstandings derived from his murder trial, the president's assassination and its aftermath are now being blamed on him. Thus, he himself was now also the cause of the massacre of 25 million innocent Jews. He had seen his own brother tortured, horribly mutilated, castrated, and burned in the street outside the jail. He could still hear the screams. He had seen and heard many other similar horrors. The orders for this terrible uh, pogrom must have come from Washington to permit the police to carry out the mass murders without federal troops being called out or invested. Attempts to persuade the patient that these beliefs were incorrect or the symptoms of mental illness aroused his anger. He became more suspicious of my sincerity and once or twice seemed about, uh, about to attack me. He repeatedly intimated that he was being mocked or conned by the examiner. Me, since I know all the thing, since I know all about the things he was telling me, don't tell me you don't know about it. Everybody must know about it. He kept repeating that after what happened last night, there was nothing more in life for him. He had smashed his head against the wall in order to put an end to it. Whether it was the genocide raging across the land or his own personal torment that could not be terminated was not clear. Attempts to discuss psychiatric examinations or the pending hearings or his prospective appeal or a new trial was fruitless. He felt the talk of a new trial was just a mockery after what happened last night and that he would be rotten and despicable to want to survive or be saved after having caused a great people with a history of 4,000 years to be wiped out. I persuaded the patient to let me invite Dr. Mr. David Candish, one of his attorneys, to step into the room and then watch the two talk at cross purposes for a while. As the lawyer continued to discuss plans for the appeal, Ruby became increasingly agitated and clearly paranoid as it dawned on him that Mr. Candish, whom he trusted, was now pretending not to know what had happened last night. Attempts to carry out many more formal aspects of a mental status examination were impossible. The patient was oriented in place and person, but perhaps not for time. He was non-responsive to many inquiries. Concentration was poor. Associations and continuity of thought were inter interrupted. Some material pertinent to his shooting of Oswald was elicited, but is not included in this report. At this time, Mr. Ruby is obviously psychotic, he is completely preoccupied with delusions of persecution of the Jews on his account. He feels hopeless, worthless, and guilty because he is to blame for the mass murders of his own people. The experiences of last night are not only grossly delusions, but include auditory and visual hallucinations as well. His emotions are abnormal feelings of anxiety, depression, guilt, suspiciousness, and despair are expressed in various proportions. Often the effect is inappropriate to the ideas accompanying them. The diagnostic impression is an acute psychotic reaction, a paranoid state, manifested by delusions, uh, visual and auditory hallucinations, suspiciousness, agitation, inappropriate affect, unshakable fixed preoccupations, depression, suicidal impulses, an impairment of reasoning, judgment, concentration, and progression of thought. So now how fucked up is Jack Ruby? Uh, the etiology, not fully determined. The stress of the patient's recent life situation is undoubtedly an important factor. 
Other contributing factors, including organic brain disease, chronic or acute, should be explored. Prognosis for the present acute psychotic reaction, fair. If proper treatment is promptly instituted. Recommendation, immediate psychiatric hospitalization, study and treatment. Close observation along with suicidal precautions. The possibility that the patient is malingering or feigning, feigning mental illness are, were carefully considered. In my opinion, this is not true of this individual at this time. First, I doubt that someone unfamiliar with technical psychiatry could play the part of a paranoid, delusional, psychotic person with such accuracy, consistency, and typical detail. Second, it places Mr. Ruby at cross-purpose with his attorneys who have repeatedly encouraged him to believe that he has an excellent chance for a successful appeal and that a new trial, he would not only be saved from the death penalty, but that a much more sympathetic understanding of him would emerge. Third, I don't believe he wants to go to a mental hospital at all. Despite his attorney's belief that he should, he actually prefers the jail where he says they know me. That is inconsistent with his fears of murderous police in itself characteristic of his delusional state. Finally, he violently rejects the idea that he is mentally ill now or that he is suffering from abnormal thoughts and feelings. The true malingerer usually grasps uh, at each at such an explanation. The unexpected discovery that this individual has developed an acute psychotic reaction naturally requires me to postpone consideration of the examinations into his mental status at the time of the shooting last November. Jack Ruby is technically insane at this time. He is not now capable of cooperating intelligently in his own defense. The essential details of the condition of this patient as described above were transmitted to Sheriff Decker at 5.20 p.m. today in the presence of Mr. David Candish. Included were the facts that the patient was acutely mentally ill, actively suicidal, and in need of immediate hospitalization. Now, I told you before that they called in the big guns when they did this. And that big gun was named Louis Jolion West, professor of psychiatry, University of Oklahoma School of Medicine. Now, some of you, maybe, have heard that name before. Louis Jolion West. Or maybe you've heard him by a different name. Jolly West. Dr. Jolly West. Uh, now, that was April the 26th when that was written. The next day, we have a uh, a different report from old Jolly. And it states thus. <clears throat> April 27, 1964. Upon re-examining Mr. Jack Ruby from 8 to 9.30 this morning, I found his condition to be considerably improved over last night. His general aspect was changed from one of agitated suspiciousness to one of wary bewilderment. He tried to avoid discussion of his delusional preoccupations that the Jews were being murdered. Apparently, a visit from his sister last night had reassured him somewhat. However, when I asked him about his brothers, he mumbled, I imagine they're gone. Then when he, told, then when he was told that his brother Earl was also coming to see him and had been contacted by long-distance telephone, he said that he must have been mistaken about the identity of the man he took to be his brother being killed out in the, in the street the previous night. When I asked him how he knew it was even a Jew he had seen, he carefully avoided my glance and said, ah, that's a good question. Mr. Ruby was clearly suspicious and evasive during this interview. After seeing me, he told his visiting rabbi that he couldn't trust me because he didn't know what part I might have in it. Quote, and revealed that he thought the murders were really still going on but that it would be safer to avoid the subject. There were many signs of considerable improvement of symptoms overnight. 
There was a return of his known previous willingness to discuss the Oswald slaying, and he gave some attention to the progress of his defense. Although this interest was still considerably less than usual, according to one of his attorneys, while he frequently mentioned Oswald by name last night, today again he referred to him as only the deceased or that person. He reviewed his account of the Oswald slaying, which was consistent with that given during the florid psych psych psychotic period last night. This material is not reported here. During the interview, there were four periods, lasting from one to three minutes each, of obvious auditory hallucinations. The patient would quickly rise, move to a corner of the room, and stand with his head cocked, eyes wide, darting about. Once he heard voices coming from below, and crawled under the bed to listen. His spontaneous com commentary and responses to my questions both revealed that the hallucinations were of human groans and cries, sometimes of children or a child, and that the patient thought that they might be Jews under torture. However, when each hallucinatory episode ceased, he would quickly try to gather together the threads of our previous conversation and discuss some other topic. Throughout the examination, the patient frequently rubbed or covered his left eye and occasionally complained of unpleasant head sensations or a sense of difficulty in thinking. My thoughts keep going around in circles, doctor. Diagnostic impression remains unchanged. The patient is now in partial remission. He might continue to improve, in which case the psychotic break will have been of the, quote, 24-hour variety, often seen by the military psychiatrist among men under stress. If so, it might recur under future stress. On the other hand, this morning's improvement may, may, be, may be merely part of the usual fluctuation of intensity of psychopathology common in paranoid psychosis. If so, unpredictable, unpredictable outbursts of psychotic behavior and fluctuating degrees of contact with reality hour by hour can be expected. It is still my belief that this individual should be in a psychiat psychiatric hospital for observation study and treatment at the present time. Sincerely, Louis Jolion West, Professor of Psychiatry, University of Oklahoma School of Medicine. And let's see, he did end up sending uh, the Honorable Henry Wade, District Attorney of Dallas County. Dear Mr. Wade, uh, it was good to have a chance to talk to you after the hearing on April the 27th. If Jack Ruby's mental illness continues, I hope it will be possible for him to be put in a mental hospital soon. I'm enclosing the results of my examinations for your personal interest and look forward to seeing you again soon preferably on a happier occasion. Sincerely yours, Louis Jolion West. Uh, this is P.S. The enclosed reprint might be, might possibly be of interest to you and your associates. And unfortunately, we don't have the contents of the letter, just the cover letter, cover letter itself. Now comes the intriguing question of whether or not Jack Ruby was the victim of CIA mind control and Project MK Ultra. Uh, it appears throughout the history of this project that Jolly West was what you could look at to be uh on the on the leading edge and into researching mind control hypnosis and the use of LSD in making people do what you want them to do otherwise known as project MK Ultra now MK Ultra you know didn't didn't originate with this man um there's several others involved uh even Sidney Gottlieb, a Nazi scientist. Um, and I'm not insinuating that, that Jolly West uh, did anything to Jack Ruby. 
but his initial doctor, I believe Jolly West was more like a cleanup guy. Like when shit started to go sideways, um, they called him in to kind of tidy things up. So maybe doc, this Dr. Hubert Winston Smith, who had originally been uh, Jack Ruby's, doing Jack Ruby's, quote, psychiatric evaluations, um, could have possibly been administering him IVs of truth serum, LSD, um, causing these severe mental breaks in Jack Ruby where he didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, where he was having uh, visual hallucinations and auditory hallucinations of Jews dying by the millions um, and that everything was his fault. And, it, you know, it's just, it's plausible, <laughs> you know, that, that whatever this, this original doctor was trying to do, uh, things kind of backfired and Jack Ruby went off the proverbial reservation, if you will. And they had to call in the big cleanup man, Jolly West to try to, uh, you know, bring things somewhat back to normal. Um, and, and Jolly West is no, no, uh, no stranger to being called in to do some cleanup work. Um, there was a big case in Texas, uh, you know, before Jack Ruby. Um, there was a man named Shaver who had, uh, who had supposedly killed a, a girl named Sherry Jo Horton. Um, and they called him in and he ended up confessing to the crime. He says, now you remember it all, don't you, Johnny? And he says, yes, sir. Um, and the lawyers tried to scrutinize Shaver's medical history. And a uh, little mention was made of the base hospital where Jolly West's archive letters indicate he had conducted MK Ultra experiments on uh, enlisted soldiers. Uh, Shaver had suffered from migraines so debilitating that he dunk his head in a bucket of ice. Uh, when he felt one coming on, his condition was severe enough that the Air Force had recommended him for a two-year experimental program, and the doctor who'd attempted to recruit him was not named in court records or transcripts. On the stand, West said he'd never gotten around to seeing whether Shaver had been treated in the, in the experimental program or not. Lackland officials told me there was no record of him in their master index of patients, but curiously, according to the base's archivist, all the records for patients in 1954 had been maintained, with one exception. The file of last names beginning with S-A through S-T, which just happened to include this guy Shaver, had somehow vanished. Imagine that. Imagine that, folks. Uh, Jolly West's professional fascination with LSD was practically as old as the drug itself. For several decades, he was one of an elite cadre of scientists using it in top-secret research. LSD was synthesized in 1938 by chemists at Switzerland Sandoz Industries, but it was not introduced as a pharmaceutical until 1947. And in the 50s, when the CIA began to experiment on humans with it, it was a, quote, new substance. Albert Hoffman, the Swiss scientist who discovered its hallucinogenic qualities in 1943, described it as a, quote, sacred drug that gestured toward the mystical experience of a deeper, comprehensive reality. In the 50s, even before hippies embraced the drug, very few people took LSD without having somebody being a, quote, trip leader. Uh, the suggestibility from LSD was akin to that associated with hypnosis. Wes had studied the two in tandem. He said, you can tell somebody to hurt somebody, but you call it something else. Fisher explained, hammer the nail into the wood. And the wood, perhaps, is a human being in the patient's mind. Wes seems to have used chemicals liberally 
in his medical practice, and his tactics left an indelible mark on the psychiatrist who worked with him. One of them, Gilbert Rose, was so baffled by the Shaver case that he went on to write a play about it. In my 50 years in the profession, that was the most dramatic moment ever, when he clapped his hands to his face and remembered killing that girl. Rose said in 2002 of Shaver and the True Serum interview, but Rose was shocked when I told him that West had hypnotized Shaver in addition to giving him sodium pentothal intravenously. Hypnotism, he said, was not part of the protocol for the interview. He'd also never known how West had found out about the case right away. We were involved from the first day, Rose. We were involved from the first day, Rose recalled. Jolly phoned me the morning of the murder. He initiated contact. West claimed he was in the courtroom the day Shaver was sentenced to death, and around this time, he became vehemently opposed to capital punishment. Did he know his experiments might have led to the accusation of an innocent man and the death of a child? If his correspondence with CIA head of MK Ultra Gottlieb, predating the crime by just a year, had been presented at trial, would the outcome have been the same? Almost as soon as they had access to it, government scientists saw LSD as a potential Cold War miracle drug. Full-fledged research into LSD began soon after the end of World War II when American intelligence learned that the USSR was developing a program to influence human behavior through drugs and hypnosis. In 1949, the CIA launched Project Bluebird, a mind control program that tested drugs on American citizens, most in federal penitentiaries or on military bases, who didn't even know about, let alone consent to, the battery of procedures they underwent. Their abuse found further justification in 1952 when, in Korea, captured American pilots admitted on national radio that they'd sprayed the Korean countryside with illegal biological weapons. It is a confession so beyond the pale that the CIA blamed the communists uh, the POWs must have been brainwashed. The word, a little translation of the Chinese Z now, didn't appear in English before 1950. It articulated a set of fears that had coalesced in post-war America that a new class of chemicals could rewire and automate the human mind. Yeah. So, when the American POWs returned, the Army brought in a team of scientists to, quote, deprogram them. Among those scientists were Jolly West. Born in Brooklyn in 1924, he enlisted in the Air Force during World War II, eventually rising to the rank of Colonel. His friends called him Jolly for his middle name, impressive girth, Ooh, impressive girth, and oversized personality. When he got out, he researched methods of controlling human behavior at Cornell University. He would later claim that it would have studied 83 prisoners of war, 56 who had been forced to make false confessions. He and his colleagues were credited with reintegrating the POWs into society, and it may be more important, getting them to renounce their claims about having used biological weapons. So here we have the start of Jolly West as cleanup man, folks. Uh, West's success with the POWs gained him entrance into the upper echelons of the intelligence community. Sidney Gottlieb, the poisons expert who headed the chem chemical division of the CIA's technical services staff, along with Richard Helms, the CIA's chief of operations for the Directorate of Plans, had convinced the agency's then-director, Alan Dulles, that mind control ops were the future. Initially, the agency wanted only to prevent further potential brainwashings by the Soviets. But the defensive program became an offensive one, and Operation Bluebird morphed into Operation Artichoke, a search for an all-purpose truth serum. In a speech at Princeton University, Alan Dulles warned that communist spies can turn the American mind into a, quote, Phonograph playing a disc put on its spindle by an outside genius. Just days after those remarks on April the 13th, 1953, he officially set Project MK Ultra into motion. Little was known about the program, and after Watergate, Helms, who by that time was CIA director, ordered Gottlieb to destroy all MK Ultra papers. In January 1973, the technical services staff shredded countless documents describing the use of hallucinogens. 
in the mid 70s after the times revealed the existence of mk ultra on its front page the government launched three separate investigations all of which were hobbled by the cia's destruction of its files vice president nelson rockefeller's commission on cia activities within the united states senator frank church's senate collect senate select committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities, and <clears throat> Senators Edward Kennedy and Daniel Inouye's joint Senate Select Committee hearings on Project MKUltra, the CIA's program on research and behavioral modification in 1977. When records were available, they were redacted, and when witnesses were summoned to testify before Congress, they were for forgetful, conveniently. Hmm. We do know that the project's broadest goal was to influence human behavior. Under its umbrella were at least 150 sub-projects, many involving research on unwitting participants. Gottlieb, whose aptitude and amorality earned him the nickname the Black Sorcerer, developed gadgetry straight out of schlocky sci-fi shit. Schlocky sci-fi high-potency stink bombs, swizzle sticks laced with drugs, Exploding seashells, poison toothpaste, most of which were used to try to kill uh, Fidel Castro. Having persuaded an Indianapolis pharmaceutical company to replace, to replicate, sorry, the Swiss formula for LSD, the CIA had a limitless domestic supply of its new favorite drug. The agency hoped to pr produce couriers who could embed hidden messages in their brains to implant false memories and remove true ones in people without their awareness. That'd be convenient to use on Jack Ruby, don't you think, folks? To convert groups to opposing ideologies and more. The loftiest objective was the creation of a hypno-programmed assassin known as Manchurian Candidates. Hmm. The most sensitive work was conducted far, far away from Langley. It farmed out and farmed it out to scientists at colleges, hospitals, prisons, and military bases all over the United States and Canada. The CIA gave these scientists alibis, funneled money to them, and instructed them on how to conceal their research from prying eyes, including those of their unknowing subjects. Their work encompassed everything from electronic brain stimulation to sensory deprivation to induced pain and psychosis. They sought ways to cause heart attacks, severe twitching, and intense cluster headaches. If drugs didn't do the trick, they tried to master ESP, ultrasonic vibrations, and radiation poisoning. One project tried to harness the power of magnetic fields. MKUltra was so highly classified that when John McCone succeeded Dulles as CIA director in late 61, he was not informed of his existence until 1963. Fewer than half a dozen agency brass were aware of, of it at any period during its 20-year history. Now back to Jolly West, folks. West headed the psychiatry department at UCLA and the school's renowned neuroscience center until his retirement in 1988. One day, among a batch of research papers on hypnosis in West's archives there, uh, letters were found between West and his CIA handler, quote, Sherman Grifford. That cover name, according to John Marks, the search for the Manchurian candidate, was for Sidney Gottlieb. West, who had once written to a magazine editor that he had, quote, never worked for the CIA, but had, in fact, worked closely with the agency's black sorcerer himself. The letters picked up midstream with no prologue or preliminaries. The first was dated June 11, 1953, two months after MK Ultra started, when West was chief of the psychiatric service at the air base at Lackland. Uh, addressing Gottlieb as SG, West outlined the experiments he proposed to perform using a combination of psychotropic drugs and hypnosis. He began with a plan to discover the degree to which information can be extracted from presumably unwilling subjects through hypnosis alone or in combination with certain drugs. 
possibly with subsequent amnesia for the interrogation and or alteration of the subject's recollection of the information he formerly knew. Another item proposed honing techniques for implanting false information in particular subjects or for inducing them specific mental disorders. He hoped to create couriers who would carry a long and complex message embedded secretly in their minds and to study the induction of trance states by drugs. His list lined up perfectly with the goals of MKUltra. Needless to say, West added the experiments must eventually be put to test in practical trials in the field. To this end, he asked Gottlieb for, quote, some sort of carte blanche to do what he wanted. But who would the guinea pigs be? He listed four groups, basic airmen, volunteers, patients, and others, possibly including prisoners and the local stockade. Only the volunteers would be paid. The others could be unwilling, and though it wasn't spelled out unwitting, it would be easier to preserve his secrecy if he were, quote, inducing specific mental disorders in people who already exhibited them. Certain patients requiring hypnosis and therapy or suffering from dissociative disorders, trances, fugues, amnesias, might lend themselves to our experiments. Official investigation into MK Ultra yielded a little information about its subjects, but West's letter suggests that the program cast a wide net. Gottlieb's reply came on letterhead from Chemrophile Associates, a front company he used to correspond with MK Ultra subcontractors. My good friend, I had been wondering whether your apparent rapid and a comprehensive grasp of our problems could possibly be real. You have indeed developed an admirably accurate picture of exactly what we are after, and for this I am deeply grateful. Gottlieb saluted his new recruit. We have gained quite an asset in the relationship we are developing with you. West returned the camaraderie. It makes me very happy to realize that you consider me an asset. Surely there is no more vit vital under undertaking conceivable in these times. In 1954, around the same time as the Sherry Joe Horton murder, West began to split his time between Lackland and the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, where he would lead the psychiatry department. West told his prospective employer that his Lackland duties were, quote, purely clinical, and that he'd been doing no research, classified or otherwise. And he asked that the board of directors at Oklahoma for permission to accept money from the Geshtiker Fund for Medical Research, which he called a, quote, non-profit private research foundation. In fact, as the CIA later acknowledged, Geshtiker was another of Gottlieb's fictions, a shell organization enabling him to fund research across the United States. In 1956, West reported back to the CIA that the experiments he'd begun in 53 had at last come to fruition. In a 1956 paper entitled The Psychological Studies of Hypnosis and Suggestibility, he claimed to have achieved the impossible. He knew how to replace true memories with false ones in human beings without their knowledge. Without detailing specific incidents, he put it in layman's terms. It has been found to be feasible to take the memory of a definite event in the life of an individual and through hypnotic suggestion bring about the subsequent, subsequent conscious recall to the effect that this event, this event never actually took place, but that a different fictional event actually did occur. He'd done it, he claimed, by administering new drugs effective in speeding the induction of the hypnotic state and in deepening the trance that can be produced in given subjects. At the... Uh, National Security Archives in D.C., a version of the psychological studies of hypnosis and suggestibility that the CIA turned over to Senators Kennedy and Inouye in 1977. West's name and affiliations were redacted as expected, but the CIA's version was also shorter and watered down in comparison. West's document was 14 pages, and this one was five. It included a cover page. Most glaringly, there was no mention of West's triumphant accomplishment the replacement of the memory of a definite event in the life of an individual with a fictional event. 
the effects of LSD upon the production, maintenance, and manifestation of dissociated estates has never been studied, claimed West. West, of course, had studied those effects for years, but when it came to elaborating on his findings about implanting memories, even in the paper found in West's own files, he offered few details. Acid, he wrote, made people more difficult to hypnotize. It was better to pair hypnosis with long bouts of isolation and sleep deprivation. So, Jolly West. Now it gets better, folks. His, his connections throughout the... Uh, I mean, we, we can go all the way up through the 60s. You have him in... Uh, Kate Ashbury, <laughs> Jolly West, was the only scientist in the world who predicted the emergence of potentially violent LSD cults, such as Charles Manson's, Manson's family. In a 67 psychiatry textbook, West had contributed a chapter called Hallucinogens, warning students of a remarkable substance percolating through college campuses and into cities. LSD was known to leave users unusually susceptible and emotionally Emotionally liable, labile, whatever that means. Uh, it appealed to alienated kids who would crave a, quote, shared forbidden activity in a group setting to provide a sense of belongings. In other of his papers, um, he would go on to quote such things as hip being hypno-programmed, um, the dangers of hypnosis, Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just I'm just going up through here to see what all he was uh, incorporated with here. Um, now, a lot, a lot of people may have heard about Frank Olson, right, a military contract scientist who'd been unwittingly, unwittingly dosed with LSD at a small agency gathering in the backwoods of Maryland, presided over by Sidney Gottlieb himself. Olson fell into an irreparable depression afterwards, which led him to hurl himself, allegedly, out of the window of a New York City hotel where agents had brought him for, quote, treatment. A continued investigation by Olson's son, Eric, dramatized by Errol Morris in the series Wormwood, strongly suggests that the CIA arranged for the agents to fake his suicide, throwing him out the window because they feared he would blow the whistle on MKUltra and the military's use of biological weapons in the Korean War. The news of Olsen's death shocked a nation already re reeling from Watergate and now less inclined than ever to trust its institutions. Uh... The Senate demanded the formations of a federal program to locate the victims of MKUltra experiments and to pursue criminal charges against the perpetrators. That program never coalesced. Surviving records named 80 institutions, 44 universities and colleges, and 185 researchers, among them Louis Jolion West. The Times identified West as one of less than a dozen suspected scientists who secretly participated in MK Ultra under an academic cover. <laughs> wow. So I'm just trying to find this here. Yeah, so here's a weird one for you folks. One of the more unusual incidents in West's career took place in August of 1962. He and two co-workers attempted to investigate the phenomenon of must in elephants by dosing Tusco, a bull elephant, at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Oklahoma City with LSD. 
They expected that the drug would trigger a state similar to must. Instead, the animal began to have seizures five minutes after the LSD was administered. Beginning 20 minutes later, West and his colleagues administered the antipsychotic promazine hydrochloride. They injected it a total of 2,800 milligrams over 11 minutes. This large promazine dose was not effective and may have contributed to the animal's death. It died an hour and 40 minutes after the LSD was given. Later, many theories developed as to why Tusco had died. Some researchers thought West and his colleagues had made a mistake of scaling up the dose in proportion to the animal's body weight rather than its brain weight and without considering other factors such as its metabolic rate. Another theory was that while the LSD had caused Tusco distress, the drugs administered in an attempt to revive him caused the death. Attempting to prove that LSD alone had not been the cause of death, Ronald Siegel of UCLA repeated a variant of West experiments on two elephants. He administered to two elephants equivalent doses in milligrams per kilogram to that which had been given to Tusco, mixing the LSD in their drinking water rather than directly injecting it. Neither elephant expired or inhibited any great distress, although both behaved strangely for a number of hours. Well, probably so. So, Jolly West killed a uh, elephant with LSD, apparently. Mm. So, he's been uh, tied to MK Ultra, uh, the Manson family, San Francisco in the 60s, the Patty Hearst trial. West was appointed by the court in his capacity as a brainwashing expert and worked without fee, much like Jack Ruby's, believing that Hearst displayed all the classic signs of coercion, brainwashing, and the Stockholm effect. He wrote, a, he wrote a newspaper after the trial article asking President Carter to please release Patty Hearst from prison. Some weeks after her arrest, Hearst reputated her SLA allegiance. Uh, according to West, Scientologists attempt to discredit him and get him fired using messages similar, using methods similar to those used in Operation Freakout. This was allegedly done after his contributions to a 1980 textbook that classified Scientology as a cult. I read parts of the letter to the thousand plus psychiatrists and then told myself Scientologists in the crowd to pay attention. I said I would like to advise my colleagues that I consider Scientology a cult and L. Ron Hubbard a quack and a fake. I wasn't about to let them intimidate me. In 1999, Jolly West died at his home in Los Angeles at the age of 74. His family said the cause of death was metastatic cancer. However, West's son John would later assert in a 2009 memoir that he helped his father end his life at the latter's choice by using prescription medication due to the terminal illness he was facing. I wonder if he overdosed like the elephant on LSD. What a way to go. At least in my opinion. That would have capped his life off uh, pretty good. So, folks, we have uh, Jack Ruby being treated by MK Ultra, LSD, research scientist Jolly West. Um, what's interesting is there was a, there's also a Timothy McVeigh connection with Jolly West, a Chandra Levy connection with Jolly West. Um, crazy stuff. David Koresh as well. Um. Sirhan Sirhan as well, folks. So, now this guy was, had connections to a lot of, a lot of this stuff. Also, uh, a connection to Kanye West's mother. 
he was treating Kanye West's mother. Uh, crazy stuff. You know, we've all seen the the uh, quote psychotic breaks that Kanye West has had on stage over the years, and how much losing his mother affected him. Um, he was instrumental in the Cult Awareness Network, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Ronald Reagan, Jack Ruby, Sirian and Sirian, Patty Hearst, Timothy McVeigh, hypnosis. Uh, you know, this guy was in it. Um, apparently, Chandra Levy had noted that 12 or more visits to McVeigh were made by Dr. Louis Jolion West, UCLA mind control effort. I pronounced Jack Ruby insane after he suggested a conspiracy in the assassination. He was also the government psychiatrist who handled Sirhan Sirhan while he awaited trial. Yeah, all that. All of that, folks. Holy cannoli. So, was Jack Ruby tripping his balls off in prison? When it comes to all of these Jews dying and children screaming and all this crazy shit going around, going on, it would appear something like that was happening. I mean, while Jack Ruby may have been in, in, impulsive and short tempered, uh, never before had he had a quote mental break like the one he had. Uh, after his trial but who knows folks just saying it wouldn't surprise me a bit for them to try to do something to affect Jack Ruby's memory or his facilities or implant or redact memories side of his head anyway that's it for this week folks this one's in the bag make sure you head over to twitter at the lone gummin 7 on facebook search for the lone gummin podcast page other than that this is your boy rob until next time folks peace watch out for that acid <laughs>